words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. What a beautiful gathered group. I think we're growing more. <laughs> and it has been rumored that there was a game tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's over already. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting because I planned to start my sermon talking about sports, and Martha said something about sports, and what I have to say about sports is that I don't know anything about sports. I never have, and it's not really my fault. I have all kinds of excuses. Uh, um, my mother never did sports, and my father was 36 when he got married, and he'd already done all his sports. Mm -hmm. Apparently, he was a really good hockey player, but of course, I didn't get to see any of that. So I didn't learn about it, and I have no siblings to teach me about sports. And when I got to school, they assumed that I already knew, and they'd say, go play basketball, go play baseball, but nobody ever explained how to do those things. <laughs> so I was very poor at them, never to put it mildly. So I thought about this because of Blue Jays, because I heard that they had won, uh, they had, excuse me, they had lost one game, and then I heard that they lost two games, and it was the best of seven series, and now I think they've lost either three or four. How many have they lost? Four, they're done. Four. It's over. Okay, well, you don't need to talk about sports anymore then. But uh, there's another kind of sport that I do engage in. Wrestling. <laughs> now, what kind of wrestling do you think that is? I bet Martha knows. Wrestling, and, and Mari knows, <laughs> People who go to seminary learn very quickly that we do have a wrestling match every time we have a sermon because we prepare that and we wrestle with the text. But it's a good kind of wrestling. Uh, but it's never easy. It's never easy. And, and we love doing it. I, I believe we all love doing it or we wouldn't be doing it. And I encourage you all to be doing this too. But what you do is there are certain rules about this wrestling match. It's like Jacob and the angel, and uh, God's going to win this, we hope, you know, and uh, it, because we've got to play the game right, and the, we, the first two words we learn in seminary are eisegesis and exegesis, and we think, whoa, that's a big word, but all it means is that if you do eisegesis, that means you already know what you think about the story. We all have opinions about Bible stories before we start, right? And you go in and you lay your opinion on top of the story. And then you come up with, well, basically, your opinion. And we're not here to preach our opinion. We're here to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So what we're to do is eisegesis, which means that we go in. Now, we've always got all kinds of stuff that goes in with us. Our whole history, our experience, our faith, um, our lives, the day, the way we feel that day. But we go in and try to keep that clear and actually look at what it says. Now, isn't that you? Look at what it says. But it's amazing how many times we go in thinking we know what it says and seeing something, and we see different things every time. And you will, too, of course, and I'm sure a lot of you do this when you're looking at a Bible passage. But I always say, I'm going to try to empty myself as much as I can, and then I'll go in and see what it says. So here we have a, a very difficult text. And we had a few days because, because uh, Scott was going to preach and we thought he might not be able to get back in time, you know. So I thought, well, okay, here we go. And the wrestling match began. Because, um, so I come up with some ideas for you to, to share with you about this passage. And then you can, you can take it off from there in your own, with your own thoughts of, of how God is speaking to us. This passage, in this passage in Luke, Jesus says... That if we commit, if we speak against uh, the Son of Man, we will be forgiven. Ah, that's good news. Already good news. What is the Son of Man? Well, we always think it's Jesus Himself, but it can mean he, he might have meant me. You know, if you speak against me, you can be forgiven, or your fellow man, your fellow humans, uh, each other. In other words, if we speak against each other, there is forgiveness. But if we speak or commit a sin or speak against the Holy Spirit of God, it will not be forgiven. And when I see that, it makes me crazy because I believe that there's good news there. 
but I can't see it right away. Because what I see is, I was always, I guess what you call it, I, I'm a, a universalist, I guess, to some degree, that I think that, I believe that everybody can be forgiven always by God, because God is infinitely wise and infinitely forgiving and loving, and so what is this about? Well, what is it about? Jesus is a teacher at this point, isn't he? He's going around talking to people and things are starting to move against him and, and things are going to be bad and he knows that people are going to suffer and he's telling them, he's giving them a warning and he's giving us a warning that, that then the worst thing, I guess the, the other way you could say it is, the worst thing you can do is to go against the work of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? You know? And we ponder on it and then we just kind of put it away and go on to the next thing because, hi darling, <laughs> she's so beautiful. Um, we, we don't want to deal with it. But the Holy Spirit is something we also learn about when we go to school and we think, I can remember writing paper after paper on the Trinity. Because we've got to get that straight if we're going to be doing this work. The Trinity is a complicated idea about God that is the, the Christian idea of who God is. God in three persons. God, the parent, the father, the mother, whatever. God, the son, Jesus Christ, our brother, our, our savior, and God, the Holy Spirit. And then we had to write papers about what exactly that identity was of the Holy Spirit. And of course, I'm sure people came up with different thoughts and different studies from various scholars. But basically, the Holy Spirit is God in action. God moving in the world. God doing God's work. And if we go against that, we're trying to interfere with God. We're trying to interfere with the most important thing in the world, and that is to bring about goodness and love for each other. So if we, do, if we go against that, we're hurting we're hurting. We're hurting everything and everyone and ourselves. And so he's warning us about that. That's what I believe. I believe he's warning us that this is the worst thing you can do. Well, you see, that's right. Those bad people that are going against the work of God. They're going to be judged. And of course, we try not to be judgmental, but it helps us to deal with it if we can say it's somebody else. And I think about all the... I think, well, who in the world right now is going against the work of God? 90% of this, well, not 90, a good portion of the time, it's done in the name of God, isn't it? In the name of religion, when people become so overzealous that they're right and we're wrong that they want to kill us all. And it's happened in Christianity that a lot of death has taken place also. So we're, we're not innocent historically of that guilt. So the Holy Spirit is working, and we're called to participate in that. So in what ways, just for a couple of minutes, let's not judge ourselves too badly, but let's think about what we might be doing right now in our nice, pure, holy lives that would go against the work of the Holy Spirit. What would it be? I thought about that, came up with a couple of ideas. And they don't seem like terribly important things, but maybe they are important. Maybe we need to stop doing those things. One of them is to, to not move forward with the work of God because we're, uh, do, we're, we're, we're selfish about it. Maybe we're judging other people. That's one thing, judging other people. Okay. And another thing would be assuming that other people don't uh, aren't good people. And maybe we just made a little joke about it. Maybe we just had a passing comment about somebody who's different from us. You know? Uh, and what about people that we, that are, <laughs> God wants, God wants God's, vul our, the vulnerable people to be loved and to be cherished and to be lifted up and to be helped, to help them along. Are we hanging on too tightly to our own security in order to, and not making things better for others? Those that are vulnerable. And, and we're, 
wonderful. We are going to help refugees. I'm not just talking about us, but we're going to, we're going to help refugees, and we, we're all for the helping the poor and making sure that people get fed and have enough to eat and all of those things. But it, you can, we can always go a step further with it. There's always somebody. For example, do, if the person were a criminal, would we judge them? I think we might be judgmental of them. Or if a person was some kind of an addict and we didn't approve of that. There are all kinds of things. The other thing we might be doing is just protecting our own interests a little bit too much. There are many, many, many things that we can be doing that are in some tiny little way moving in the wrong direction, going against the work of God. So I think that Jesus is calling us to say, this is a serious business, the work of God in the world. The work of God in the world is to make the world a better place so that everyone can be happy. And God wants that so badly that, that we, we need to just hone ourselves a little bit and look at ourselves and say, maybe I could be a little better in this or that and, and try to, you know, without being, being too harsh on ourselves to, to do that. Now the next thing is that there is, is there forgiveness for this? And I think I may have heard this from Martha or Scott, I know I heard it in this church, that even sometimes when something doesn't look like there's forgiveness, that sometimes that was written, or at least is about a time before the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the death and resurrection of Jesus promises salvation to the world the world. So there's hope there for us and for them, for everyone because of that. So I believe it's a warning. Now the next thing he says is that if when you come before people who are going to persecute you, don't worry about what you're going to say. And I thought about that all over, the, over my life and I don't suppose anybody was ever persecuting me exactly. But we always have to be prepared you know, and, and we can't ever come up with exactly the right thing if we plan it, but if we allow God to speak through us in those times, then, then we'll be okay. It's a promise that God is going to speak through us and that God can speak through us. What a wonderful thing to know that God will. And maybe, we'll be, maybe they'll be persecuting us and we'll in some way and we'll be able to come right out of it. You know, because that's what that's what God can do. And the person I think of as a perfect example of, is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He was a zealous religious guy, and he wanted to get those Christians, you know, uh, punished for the for what they were doing. And then he later, of course, has this Damascus Road experience of God. And then he never really, really met Jesus in person at all, Paul. It's hard to believe, you know. But, but he must have heard those Christian people that he was persecuting telling him about, about Jesus. And this happened to him, this wonderful experience, and he became literally almost, you know, you could say the father of Christianity. And Paul was the one. And I believe that it was because those people knew that when, that when they were being persecuted, that God would give them the strength to speak. And I'd like to kind of finish this up with something that's really special to me. And that is that today is the celebration of the life of the martyr and saint, Father Jean Brebeuf. Of New France, 16, I think he died in 1630, something like that. Way, way back in New France, which was what Canada became a part of it at least. And and he was a, a very great man. Do you, did you learn about him in school? I'm not sure if I learned about him in school. Do you know why? Because my daddy told me all about him when I was a little kid about five years old. I don't know what it was about him that struck my father. But my father was not a Catholic, and Father Rebeuf was a Catholic priest. 
But somehow, I guess my father maybe had learned about him from someone special in his life, and he wanted to share that with me. So I'm this little kid, you know, could hardly get around. I was so small. And he's telling me all about this great priest, this great Catholic priest who, who went to live among the Huron people. And he learned their language, and he wrote hymns for them, and he tried to teach them about Jesus. And he was just completely loving. And what my father wanted me to know about him was how much he loved the people. He kept telling me this. He loved the people so much. I can remember his enthusiasm. And, uh, and, he, and of course, then later, the, the uh, Native people uh, were having a smallpox ep epidemic, and they didn't understand what was causing it, because nobody really knew what would have been causing it at that time. And, and he got blamed in, in some respect, because they thought he was a, some kind of a shaman, and they, and they tortured and killed him. And while they were torturing and killing him, he was praising God, begging for the lives of their people that he had converted to a few of them, and they were being tortured too, so he's begging for their lives, and he was teaching them about Jesus. And right to his death, he was speaking the word of God, doing that thing, working for the Holy Spirit, right to the end of his life. And he's remembered and loved by the native people, he's remembered and loved by by the people that had come from Europe and everyone and by us today. So this is his day today. So I think we need to celebrate him and remember. So the point of all this together is simply that God is working for good in this world. And that is very good news. And that we are called to participate in that is very good news as well. So we got it. We got good news again tonight. We always get good news when we look into our Bible. And I hope that's a little bit helpful to you to think about that passage, that God is love and God is working every day on behalf. And all we're called to do is just join right in.